Now, we've studied how a lens such as this one can be used to focus light. And so here, of course, we have a converging lens where we have a uh, curved side here and a flat side on the uh, uh, other. And this focuses light to a point. But when we studied mirrors, we could relate the focal length of a spherical mirror to the radius of curvature of the mirror, so we knew how to design and build a mirror with a particular focal length. But now what we're going to do is we're going to do the same for lenses. What we want to do is we want to relate the focal length of an air lens to the radius of curvature of the two sides. And to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to derive what is called the lens maker's equation, which determines what the focal length for a lens is in terms of the radii of curvature of the two sides of the lens. And to do that, we're going to have to study it in some depth on the computer. It's going to involve quite a bit of geometry, but fortunately not particularly complicated geometry. Um, but it is going to be a rather lengthy derivation for this equation. So let's get started. So here we have a lens, and we've taken the simplest possible uh, example we've got here. So we have a point-like object that's sitting on the optical axis of the lens. So that's the axis that goes through the uh, center of symmetry of the lens. So we have an object uh, uh, here, which is a point, and it's been imaged um, on the other side uh, to here, where we have the point-like image. And so we're considering one of the rays of light that goes out at an angle alpha 1. It hits the lens at this point here, A, it gets refracted. Of course, here we're showing sort of the idealized version where it just bends once, but of course it'll get refracted here, it'll get ref and then it'll hit the point B where it leaves the lens, gets refracted again onto this trajectory where it forms the image I, and the object is a distance U from the center of the lens, and the image is formed a distance V from the center of the lens. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the lens and we're going to cut it right down the center here and we're going to split it into two halves. And we're going to make some approximations, namely that the lens is thin, so that these points A and B, although technically they're separated, we're going to be essentially assuming that they occur at the same point because this distance between them is going to be very small, so they'll have a common height H above the optical axis. We're also going to be assuming that the uh, size of the lens here is going to be small compared to the radius of curve so that we can use some small angle approximations as well. So let's have a look at the first interaction between the ray of light and the front surface of the lens. So here we have that same diagram, but now we split up and we're only looking at the front half of the lens. So we're pretending that the rest of this is just filled with glass. Now, C1 here is the center of the radius of curvature of this front surface of the lens. So it's the center of the sphere of which this lens forms just a part of the surface. And so that means the line from the center to the surface of the sphere is a radial line, and so it's perpendicular to the surface. And so what that means is that this is the angle of incidence of the uh, ray, and this is the angle of uh, refraction. And so that gives us our first equation, and that is comes straight from the law of refraction, and that is that the uh, uh, sine of theta i1 is equal to the refractive index of the material, and so we're assuming that this lens has a refractive index of n, and we're assuming out here in the air that n is approximately equal to 1. So we just have a 1 in front of this, which is why I didn't write anything. And so this is equal to n times the sine of theta r1. And because we're assuming that this size of the lens is a lot less than the radius of curvature R1, then we can assume that these are both uh, going to be small angles, right? So these are both uh, small angles, and so we can use the small angle approximation that sine of x is approximately equal to x when x is small, and so this equation here reduces to theta i1 is equal to n times theta r1. 
And so that's our first equation. Now the next two equations are going to come from geometry. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the triangle, which is A here, uh, C1 here, and O here. Now if we look at that triangle, we can look at this angle here. And this angle, the sum of the angles, interior angles of a triangle, is 180. So this angle is 180 minus alpha 1 plus beta 1. But if we look at this straight line here, we can also see that this angle is equal to 180 minus theta i1. And what that tells us is the, that uh, theta i1 is equal to alpha 1 plus beta 1. And in fact, that's a general geometric result. The exterior angle of a triangle, which is what this angle is here, is equal to the, uh, two, the sum of the two opposite angles in the triangle. Now, we can do the same trick, but looking at a different triangle. And now we're going to look at the point A, the point C1, and the point X. And if we look at this angle here, it's 180 minus theta r1 plus gamma. And it's also equal to 180 minus beta 1. And so we have the uh, same source of the relationship, but with a different triangle. So it's a different relationship that beta 1 is going to be equal to theta r1 plus gamma. And if we rearrange that, we can get that theta r1 is equal to beta 1 minus gamma. So we've now got three equations. Here's our first equation, here's our second equation, and here's our third equation. So let's combine these to get rid of this angle of refraction and angle of incidence. So here are the three equations we got from our diagram. What we're going to do is we're going to take this and substitute it in here. And we're going to take this and we're going to substitute it in here. And when we do that, we get this equation that alpha 1 plus beta 1 is equal to the refractive index of the lens glass multiplied by beta 1 minus alpha. And so this is an equation that we'll come back to. But now we need to look at what happens when the ray leaves the lens and have a look at the refraction there. So here we have the ray now leaving the lens. So it's on this dashed, uh, dashed trajectory here towards x. Of course, it never gets there because it encounters the back face of the lens and gets refracted. So again, what we're going to introduce is the center of the sphere for which the back surface of the lens forms part of the surface. And so this line from the center to the surface is a radial line, so it's perpendicular to the surface. And that makes this the angle of incidence of this ray inside the glass of the lens. And it makes this the angle of refraction after it's left the lens. So once again, we're going to employ the law of refraction. We're assuming that now, of course, this is the uh, uh, lens. So we're assuming here that we've got a refractive index of n inside the lens, and that out here in the air, we've got a refractive index of roughly 1. And so when we do that, what we're going to have for our uh, law of refraction is that n times the sine of theta i2 is going to be equal to the sine of theta r2. And then, of course, we make the small angle approximation. And this gives us that the n times theta i2 is equal to theta times r2, because, again, we're assuming that sine of x is approximately equal to x uh, for a small value of x. So again, we're now going to do the same thing we did before with our exterior angles for uh, uh, triangles. Um, so this time, what we're taking is if we look at the triangle B, I, and then C2 here, then we can look at this angle here that's inside the triangle. And because the sum of the angles in the triangle is 180, this is 180 minus alpha 2 plus beta 2. And it's also equal to 180 minus theta r2 because of this straight line here. And so therefore, we can write that theta r2 is equal to alpha 2 plus beta 2. 
Now what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, another triangle. This triangle will be again including B. Now it's going to include X and again it will include C2 and now the angle we're going to look at is this angle all the way around to here so that's from here to here and when we look at that we can see that that's equal to 180 minus theta uh, I2 and it's also equal to 180 minus beta 2 plus gamma and so we have this relationship here that theta I2 is equal to uh, beta 2 plus gamma and so again we've got three equations and we're going to combine these uh, together to get rid of these angles of refraction and angles of incidence. So here we have the three equations along the top that we got from the uh, diagram and we're going to do the same thing we did uh, as we did for the previous diagram. We're going to substitute theta r1 from this equation into here that we got from the uh, law of refraction and we're going to get theta i2 and substitute it again into the same equation we got from the law of refraction and what that will give us is that alpha 2 plus beta 2 equals and then we have n and now we have uh, beta 2 plus gamma and so this is the equation that we got uh, from our last diagram and the equation we got from the first diagram is shown here I've just labeled it 2 and what we're going to do is we're going to add these two equations together to get rid of this angle gamma which occurs as plus n times gamma here and minus n times gamma here so when we add the two equations it will disappear and what we're going to end up with is alpha 1 plus alpha 2 plus beta 1 plus uh, beta 2 on this side and then we're just going to have n times and then beta 1 plus beta 2 on the other side. So if we take these betas and move them over to this side of the equation, then we end up with an equation that is alpha 1 plus alpha uh, 2 is equal to n minus 1 times beta 1 plus beta 2. And so now what we need to do is we need to find values for alpha 1, alpha 2, and beta 1, and beta 2. So we can replace all of these angles, alphas and betas, with um, something from the geometry. So we need to go back and look at the geometry again. So here we have the two diagrams we had before, and we're now going to look at these uh, angles. So if we look at alpha 1, then we can see that the tangent of alpha 1 is equal to the opposite, that's h, uh, divided by the adjacent, which is u. And for small angles, again, we're making this small angle approximation, we have uh, for tangent that the tangent of x is approximately equal to x, and so this is approximately equal to alpha 1. Now, if we look at beta 1, then we can write an expression for the sine of beta 1, and this is equal to the opposite, that's h, divided by the adjacent side. Well, the adjacent side goes from the center of curvature of the front face of the lens to the lens, so that's just the radius of curvature of the front face of the lens that we call capital R1. So, and this, of course, for small values, uh, sine of x is approximately uh, equal to x for small values of x, and so this is equal to, uh, roughly equal to beta 1. Now we can do the same thing for this diagram here at the bottom. If we look at alpha 2, we can see that the tangent of alpha 2 is equal to the opposite, which is h, divided by the adjacent, which is v, and for a small angle this is approximately equal to alpha 2. And similarly, we can look at the uh, angle beta 2, and we can say that the sine of beta 2 is equal to the opposite, which is h, divided by the adjacent, which is the line from the center of curvature of the back face of the lens to the surface of the lens. So that, of course, is just the radius of curvature. So we call that R2. And again, for a small angle, this is approximately equal to beta 2. So we've now got uh, approximate expressions for all four angles, alpha 1 and 2, and beta 1 and 2.
So here we have all the information we've got so far. We've got our equation that we derived from the two diagrams, and we've got all of our small angle approximations to the angles, and so what we're going to do is put them into this equation. So alpha 1 is h over u plus h over v for alpha 2, and that's equal to n minus 1 times h over r1 for beta 1 plus h over r2 for beta 2, and so we can just cancel through by h. And now we will need to go and look back at the original lens equation. And if you remember, the original lens equation had 1 over u plus 1 over v is equal to 1 over f. And this is what we've got here on this side. So we can replace this side of the equation by 1 over f, where this, of course, is the uh, focal length. And then we get what is finally called the lens maker's equation, and that is 1 over f is equal to n minus 1 times 1 over r1 plus 1 over r2. And this relates the focal length to the radii of curvature of the two sides. So the last thing we need to discuss is the sign convention that's used. So if we remember here, R1 is the radius of curvature of the front face, and R2 is the radius of curvature of the uh, rear face of the lens. And the sign convention that we use when we write the lens maker's equation this way is that R1 and R2 are greater than zero for a uh, convex face, and R1 and R2 are less than zero for a concave uh, face. So in this case, both of them are convex, so both are going to be greater than uh, zero. But of course, if we had two concave faces, we'd end up with a lens that looked like that, and that's a diverging lens. And so, of course, we'd want to have a negative answer here for the focal length. So that is the sign convention we use here. However, you often see the lens maker's equation also written in a slightly different form, and that is 1 over r1 minus 1 over r2. And in this case here, the sign here is just uh, uh, flipped. So all that happens is that the sign convention used for the rear face of the lens, so the face on the opposite side to the object, is that uh, R2 becomes uh, less than zero for convex, and it's greater than zero for a concave. Uh, now, the reason for this alternative uh, um, sign convention here, which on the face of it seems rather strange, is because if you add in an extra term in here to correct for the finite thickness of the lens, so you actually take into account that the lens has a finite thickness. When you do that, you end up having to use this sign convention because this, this missing term here to account for the thickness consists of a product of the two radii, and to get the signs correct for that, you have to flip the sign of the rear face of the lens. So that's why this rather strange sign convention exists. However, here we're only considering thin lenses, and so we're going to use the positive sign convention. So now we've seen how the focal length of a lens is related to the radius of curvature of both of the sides, as well as, of course, the refractive index of the material it's made of. But when we were doing this derivation, we made several small angle approximations. We essentially assumed that the size of the lens, the radius of the lens, if it's a circular lens, was a lot less than the radius of curvature of the two surfaces. And unfortunately, when we're building precision optical instruments, those sorts of approximations can come back to bite us, and they give rise to several optical defects that are typically referred to as aberrations. And that's what we're going to look at in the next video.